Welcome to the extreme north. This is the Svalbard archipelago, halfway between mainland Norway and the North Pole. These islands are about half the size of Cuba, but whereas Cuba has 11 million inhabitants, less than 2,500 people live here. And it isn't hard to understand why. This is the northernmost inhabited place in the world and the weather conditions here are a bit rougher than on Cuba or uh, anywhere else for that matter. There are only two towns here on Svalbard. This is Longyearbyen, the Norwegian settlement with 1,500 inhabitants. And 30 miles to the west is Barentsburg, the Russian mining town where a thousand Russians live. There isn't much contact between the two communities, but today my cooking will be inspired by both cultures. For my first dish, I'll make a beetroot soup, a Svalbard version of the classic Russian borscht. And for main course, a wonderful vodka marinated sirloin steak and a sweet dessert, pears with ginger and juniper berries. Late April and summer has arrived with the midnight sun that never sets. Still, winter has not gone away and it's freezing cold with temperatures around zero degrees. That's minus 17 Celsius. Svalbard is the most accessible high arctic area in the world and one of the few open for commercial, although limited, tourism. Dog sledges used to be the way people got around, but nowadays most people use their snowmobiles, even if they're just going shopping in Longyearbyen. The 2,500 or so people who live on Svalbard are wildlife enthusiasts, and there are as many snowmobiles on the islands as there are people. But before you can venture into the wild, there are some important rules to learn. Here, man has to obey the laws of nature if he wants to survive. And rule number one is watch out for the deadly polar bear. These white giants can be found everywhere on Svalbard. They are among the world's largest and most effective predators. Still, riding a snowmobile into the unspoiled nature is something everyone should do when visiting Svalbard. Just remember to hire a guide with a gun. Anjurid Pedersen will be my rescuer if something happens. She got the Svalbard bug during a visit here in the 1980s and she now lives here permanently. You should never leave the settlements without carrying a gun because even two minutes outside of town you may risk running into a polar bear. Or even closer. I once saw a polar bear over there by the blue snowmobile. Really? Yes. <laughs> Then we're in trouble even now. <laughs> Is it loaded? <laughs> no, it's not loaded yet. <laughs> but you're a good runner, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're tired of the fashion industry, this is really the place to go. Here, no one asks you what you look like. The only aim is to stay warm. Here, there are no demands for fashionable clothes. You don't have to show off your body. And men and women, thick and thin, they're virtually indistinguishable. Driving the snowmobile is easy, but it's quite tiring. Uh, and we've stopped for a drink here by the foot of this glacier. The glacier is actually more than 60 meters tall, 200 feet, and it was formed about 4,000 years ago.
The old Swedish merchant ship, the Origo, is a welcome sight after a few hours on the snowmobile. The boat is used as a cruise ship during the short but intense summer months. In the winter, the ship works as a hotel frozen into the ice. It's a lonely and cold place to work, but hopefully I'll manage to warm the stomachs of the friendly crew. What I'm going to make now is a Svalbard version of the classic Russian beetroot soup, the borscht. And the Svalbard cuisine has always been eclectic, if there is such a thing as a Svalbard cuisine. Uh, since almost nothing can grow here, everything has to be imported. And in Longyearbyen you can actually find a store specializing in uh, Thai food. But today, because the Russians are the second biggest nationality here on Svalbard, I have chosen to use the Russian pride the borscht as the starting point. There are numerous versions of the borscht. Uh, some say that in Ukraine alone there are 200 different borschts, but what they all have in common is the beetroot. And uh, what I have here is approximately two pounds of beetroot uh, cut into dice. Uh, I'm adding this to one onion that has been sautéed with about this much garlic and one fresh bay leaf that gives off a nice flavor. A little bit of pepper as well. So I add the beetroot and to that I add about half a pound of carrots, frozen carrots in this case, and a pound of potatoes. And if you have parsnips or celeriac, that gives off a nice flavor as well. Like most soups, the borscht requires a good stock as a foundation, and most Russian and Ukrainian versions use a rich beef stock, and more modern uh, versions tend to use uh, chicken stock. And I said that the, uh, all the food here on Svalbard has to be imported. That's not quite true, because every summer, uh, huge flocks of geese come to these islands. So I made this rich stock out of the goose. Their meat is a little bit tough but the flavor is fantastic and it's a rich rich stock. If I were to make it at home I could also use duck stock or perhaps even chicken stock. So now I've had added about a quart and a half. Uh, that's three pints or one and a half liters and this should simmer for 40 minutes until the potatoes and the beetroots are very tender. Now the soup has cooked for 40 minutes and it should be done. Um, and the only thing remaining is just to check for flavor. It has a, a rich full taste from the goose uh, stock and in addition the, the sweetness and almost intense sweetness from the beetroots as they cook. So I think the only thing it needs now is a little bit of salt and a squeeze from a lemon and then it's done. So what I'm going to do now is to puree it. Put it into a blender. You don't have to do that, but I like this to have a to be really smooth and nice. Now it's done, it's nice and smooth. And look at that color, it's fantastic. Then I'll add a little bit of sour cream, both for the flavor, the ni nice sour flavor, but also 
because of the color. And a little bit of chevrol, perhaps. Hi. 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 Det här kallar man vanlig. Det är en vanlig svalbarsbost. Ja. Ja. För nu börjar det göra lite vont. This is really the kind of soup where you can't go wrong if you have a good stock and then you add beetroots and a few other vegetables and you puree them after they've cooked. They're great any way you do it. Coal mining is the cornerstone industry for the Norwegian and Russian communities on the Svalbard archipelago. The first mine was established in 1906 by American John Monroe Longyear, giving name to the first settlement on the islands. However, Longyear's mine was emptied long ago and in the city of Longyearbyen you'll hardly see any coal miners walking the streets anymore. Instead, the town has gradually grown from being a rough company town into a surprisingly modern settlement. Many people now work in research, academia and tourism industries. The town has its own university and quite a few people up here work for the space industry. Huge satellite ground stations are a common sight. This is because Svalbard's location in the far north give excellent conditions for atmospheric research. The Russian settlement of Barentsburg is another story. Lenin still overlooks the town that was built during the Soviet era and despite the new Russian leadership, the economic situation has not improved. There's only one hotel in Barentsburg and very few other facilities, quite a contrast to the wealthy Norwegian neighbors a few miles away. For a town of no more than 1500 inhabitants, Longyearbyen must be said to have an impressive range of restaurants and bars. One of them is open only during winter, for obvious reasons, and the most popular drinks here are the warm ones. But most people on Svalbard prefer to take their outdoor jackets off when enjoying good food and wine. There are some nice restaurants in Longyearbyen and they're not as expensive as one might have feared, as there are no taxes on goods on Svalbard. We've moved inside to the University of Svalbard. Here, uh, researchers and students from all over the world come to study the Arctic. But we've thrown professors and students out today because we're going to do the cooking here inside. Uh, today I'm going to prepare a vodka marinated sirloin steak. And uh, then I'm going to make a sweet dessert with pears, with ginger and juniper berries. So the first thing I'll do is to rub the meat with a lot of sea salt. Here I have some fancy sea salt. You can use any, any type. Uh, good kosher salt is also wonderful. And now comes the part that you might find a bit surprising. The amount of pepper I'm using here is really you know, not what you would think would be edible at all. But when you're adding the pepper very early in the process, it will get a lot milder and the, the flavors will penetrate into the meat and also the cooking itself will make the pepper milder. So finally, this is enough. And as you can see, it nearly coats the entire piece of meat. And for the rest of the marinating, just place the piece of meat in a small dish or uh, possibly also in a plastic bag. And now it's time for the few other flavors to be added. A little bit of garlic, really fresh, nice garlic. Um, and I don't even bother to take the skin off because we'll remove it from the marinade afterwards. 
add it to the meat and a bit of parsley. And some thyme. I'm a great fan of thyme. It has this uh, nice perfumed flavor and um, it just gives the food another dimension without being too intrusive. It doesn't claim, you know, it doesn't have to be the star in a dish. And the only remaining thing now is a little bit of lemon. Some lemon rind adds extra freshness and a little bit of uh, tartness to, to everything as well. What now lacks is the medium in which to marinate it, and that's vodka. Um, I'm adding quite a generous amount of vodka. I'd say I'm using about a, a cup, two deciliters. The most effective way if you're using less vodka is to marinate it in a plastic bag, because uh, then you have the vodka surrounding the meat, um, and, and you won't need more than half a deciliter or uh, two ounces. Here, you see, there's a lot of vodka on the side, and that will be the basis of the kind of gravy that I'll serve uh, the meat with af afterwards. So now, basically, just let it stand and marinate in the refrigerator for one to two days. What I'm going to do first now is just slightly pat it dry. I'm keeping all, all the marinade here to, to use as a gravy afterwards. Now I'm going to sear it. First I'm putting it down, fat side down, and that will give up nice aromas and also a little bit of fat from, from the steak itself. It smells fantastic. One of the things here is uh, because we are actually using a strong alcohol, we're using vodka, uh, so we have to compensate by using kind of a lot of heat in order to make sure that the uh, alcohol evaporates because it isn't very nice if, uh, if the uh, meat still has a lot of alcohol in it. But now it will only have penetrated about half an inch uh, during uh, one day or one and a half days. So that won't be a problem. The only thing left is to put it in the oven. I, I'll add a little bit of butter, a couple of tablespoons of butter, because I think that gives it extra, nice extra flavor uh, with some fat when it cooks in the oven. But that's not necessary if you're on a diet or something. Um, my secret weapon here is, as always, the meat thermometer. I've set the meat thermometer at 140 degrees, that is 60 degrees Celsius, and I'm cooking it at approximately 425, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. That's uh, around 200 degrees Celsius. And it should cook for an hour and 15 minutes, but trust your meat thermometer, that's much more reliable than any kind of uh, ground rules here. When the core temperature has reached 125 degrees Fahrenheit, or 52 degrees Celsius, it's time to add the marinade. There's some sediment, some remains of the pepper left, and that's only nice. Now I should allow the marinade to cook for at least 20 minutes energetically, so that all the alcohol evaporates. It isn't very nice to have a gravy with a kind of alcohol flavor. So, Put it in and even kind of crank up the temperature a little bit. While the meat is cooking, I have time to prepare the dessert. It's really a simple affair, as simple as can be. It's pears cooked in honey and flavored with ginger and juniper berries. You can make all sorts of variations of this one. 
Uh, pears cooked in honey are really good in themselves. You can also flavor with rosemary or vanilla. So you start off by just peeling the pears. This is Norwegian heather honey and it's the best in the world. So about two spoonfuls of honey and just one lump of butter to make the caramel come alive more easy. So now I'll add the, the pears and they can just simmer around here for a while while I'll prepare the ginger and, and the juniper berries. So uh, here I have a nice piece of ginger. It should be all white inside, it shouldn't be brown. And the easiest way to peel it is actually by using a spoon. So finely chop the ginger between one and two uh, tablespoons. That depends a little bit on how much you like the taste of the ginger and also how fresh the ginger is. It's really nice when it becomes brown caramel like this, but I have to make sure that it doesn't burn, so I'll turn the gas down a little bit and turn the pears around every so often. And now for the really fun part, the juniper berries. The juniper berries are fantastic, I think, to use in cooking, not only to flavor gin, as most of you know it, but also uh, in Norway we use it a lot when we cook game and uh, it can also be used in sweet dishes. So I'll have to grind them finely before I eat them. And I guess I have 10 or 12 berries here. But if you have really large industrial berries you should probably not use as many. And I'm going to serve with whipped cream. And you could just use simple whipped cream, but I'm going to add a little bit of flavor, not much. And this is caraway seed. In Norway, we have this fondness for caraway seed. We had that for hundreds of years. I just don't know why, but it works wonders with a sweet cream like this. So caraway about half a teaspoon to a teaspoon, and then a little bit of sugar. How much is really up to you. Uh, well, three te teaspoons is enough for me. And a little bit of aquavit, the Norwegian potato liquor, which is flavored also with caraway and uh, fennel seeds and anise seeds. I'd say I used now about a tablespoon. If you use anything more, then you'll have problems with the, the cream. But you can, you can smell it and you can taste it. It's still quite discreet, but it gives you something extra to go with the uh, pears. Now the meat is ready and now it's resting and should rest for 15-20 minutes in order for all the juices to set. Uh, here, this is how much is left of the wonderful gravy and it tastes great. So what I want to do now is just return the flavors that I took away from it. Uh, there was a lot of herbs but I I removed them, so now I'm putting them back. This is a mixture of parsley and thyme, and then just a little bit of garlic, about half a clove of very young fine garlic. We'll need some of the freshness from the lemon, and a little squeeze from the lemon. I'm adding butter, that's not necessary, but Butter is a great flavor enhancer. This is basically it. This is the gravy that I'm serving with the meat. 
So now what I have to do is cut it into thin slices. And as you can see, it has a lovely pinkish color. It could be rarer, but in order to make sure that all the alcohol has evaporated, uh, I like it to be around medium. Now the gravy is done, and here are my guests. Hi. What I've done is to roast some tomatoes and some onions and I've also baked some lovely small potatoes with olive oil, lemon and garlic so they have a little bit more flavour than just the potato flavour. And some gravy. Not too much since it can be quite salty and this is it. No. You can find recipes from New Scandinavian cooking at the website scancook.com. <laughs>